Thank you, Martin. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Chuck Swerich. I'm a radiologist in the abdominal division here at VGH, and I've worked closely with uh, my urology colleagues for the last 25 years. So uh, what I'm going to do today is review some of the advances in imaging the stones and, and address some of the limitations as well. I have no corporate disclosures. Uh, ben, obviously, is a very popular guy. Uh, and we won't be discussing off-label applications. Um, I'm going to cover three areas. I'll review the diagnostic performance of current imaging modalities, including strengths and limitations. I'll review some of the new dual energy CT applications that are being developed. And I'll discuss uh, some aspects of radiation dose, uh, some of the risks, and also some of the solutions. Originally, I was going to be talking about pregnancy imaging, but we've left that off the menu for now in the interest of time. I'm happy to answer questions about that at the end. So I'm not going to go into much detail here. You all know this information. Uh, urinary tract stones are a common disorder. Uh, they're a source of significant morbidity. Uh, they're increasing in prevalence, and they're very costly, and they frequently recur. So moving right to imaging strategies in the acutely symptomatic patient, um, the current standard of practice pretty much globally is to use non-enhanced CT as the initial screening modality unless the patient is pre pregnant or it's a pediatric patient, in which case ultrasound is the standard of care. The single most important initial decision from an imaging standpoint is to determine the size of the patient. In somebody with a low body mass index less than or equal to 30, those patients are eligible for low-dose CT. The precision, accuracy, and sensitivity, which is over 95% for non-con CT, is maintained in those patients at a reduced dose. On the other hand, if the patient is large, greater than 30, a standard dose protocol should be, uh, should be performed. It's actually very helpful for us as radiologists when a requisition is submitted for you as the radiologist or eMERGE docs to advise us how big the patient is because then we can stratify the patient into the appropriate category to reduce the dose. If a stone is visualized, is characterized both in terms of size and location, there are a variety of other parameters which radiologists can very easily report. Uh, which may alter management and help you as a urologist. So if those things are important to you, you should speak to your radiologist and get them to tell you about those parameters. If a calculus is found and it's managed as per guidelines, if no calculus is found, uh, the, the scan is reviewed for an alternate diagnosis, which is present in up to 24% of patients. So in the acutely symptomatic patient, uh, CT has a number of advantages over all other ind individual modalities. It rapidly assesses stone extent and burden. Burden in particular is what determines management in many situations. It can evaluate the presence of obstruction. We have a high positive and negative predictive value over 95% for the detection of obstruction. Uh, we can assist you in the detection of needs for urgent intervention, as exemplified in this patient here with an obstructing proximal ureteric stone and emphysematous pyelitis gas limited to the collecting system in a septic patient. In the absence of stones, we mentioned that alternate diagnoses are relatively frequent, appendicitis, diverticulitis, gynecologic complications. With new uh, scanner technology, we can perform uh, chemical composition analysis on stone and tell you whether it's calcium-containing or uric acid and we can act as a guide for imaging follow-up. So, so it's kind of a one-stop shop for assessment of stone disease in the acute setting, and that is, that's the reason why it's a standard of care. Um, I'll briefly talk about technique. The most important thing as a urologist that you need to be aware of is that you need both axial and coronal planes, because if you only have an axial plane, you're going to be underestimating the stone size in up to a quarter of patients. Um, dual plane reconstructions are complementary. In this patient with a lower pole one centimeter stone, the management might change if you know that it's actually 1.5 centimeters in this patient. So it can alter management. If you're not already getting axial and coronals, you should ask your radiology uh, colleagues to give you those. Um, in terms of non-acute symptomatology and surveillance or follow-up, <coughs> plain radiography, whether it's uh, film or computed radiography, is, is the optimal imaging choice for most patients. It's particularly useful if the stone is visible on a prior radiograph or if we can see it on the digital scout done for localization purposes at the time of CT. If it's visible on the scout, you don't need to follow that stone with CT. You can use radiography at a frequently a much lower dose. The set pooled sensitivity for plain radiographs is in the 60% range. The specificity is moderate. However, um, it's important to recognize that if you have a prior CT to look at at the time of presentation or follow-up, 
um, that can actually improve your sensitivity for stones significantly. So the take home is if you're looking at uh, an image on PAX or Care Connect and there's a previous CT available, load that and check it out because a lot of times it will help you in terms of determining where the stone is and if in fact what you're seeing on a radiograph is indeed a stone. Um, there are limitations of course, cysteine stones tend to be ground glass density, they can be difficult to detect and there are a number of stones which are purely radiolucent on, uh, on radiography including uric acid, dinavir and pure matrix which is relatively rare. Um, just an example here, uh, the value of looking at the prior CT, this patient was referred in for lithotripsy, left-sided stone. Uh, on the radiograph, we're not really seeing anything definite. There's a couple of small opacities here. There's something over the sacrum. There's a little density there. You know, where is the stone? So the option is to do another CT or review the one that was done previously. And reviewing the previous CT, it shows that the stone is actually impacted in the ureter distally, and so that was targeted. So it improves our confidence level looking at a relatively low sensitivity study by comparing with a high sensitivity study previously. There are limitations if patients have passed the stone and you may have to repeat the CT, but often you can get away without doing that. Um, what about ultrasound? <clears throat> ultrasound has traditionally been viewed as the, uh, the, the, the black sheep in the family for detection of calculi. Uh, the pooled sensi sensitivities for combined kidney and ureter stones is around 60-65%. Um, uh, there's no question that ultrasound is better at detecting renal calculi than it is ureteric stones, but in selected patients, it is possible, particularly those with a low body mass index, to detect stones in the ureter. And so this is something that we should uh, consider. It obviously is the primary tool to be used in follow-up of pediatric patients and pregnant patients because of the lack of ionizing radiation. Ultrasound is much better for localizing stones in the distal 5 centimeters of the ureter. It's very high sensitivity. And there's a, a relatively recently described color Doppler artifact which can assist in the uh, detection of calculi called the twinkle artifact. And that can improve the sensitivity and the positive predictive value of ultrasound dramatically. There obviously are limitations with ultrasounds. It's very operator dependent. If you want good quality results, you've got to send your patients to good people. Uh, it's of limited use in morbidly obese patients for obvious reasons. And in order to see stones distally, you need to actually have a distended urinary bladder or have the scan probe placed end of vaginal in order to get close to the ureter to visualize it. Uh, a couple of important things for you as urologists to remember, we will frequently miss or overestimate small stones less than 5 millimeters. Um, so precise localization of small calculi and ultrasound has been shown to be less reliable when compared to CT. Um, in addition, in the absence of hydronephrosis, ultrasound may underestimate the stone burden in the patient. So my recommendation to you as urologists, having spent 25 years doing ultrasound and also doing lithotripsy and PCNLs, is never make a treatment decision on a patient with stone disease solely on the basis of an ultrasound. Always get a complementary <coughs> test, whether it's a radiograph or a CT. Different story if the patient's acutely obstructed and septic, ultrasound's fine, but, but for management of non-obstructed uh, patients, you, you've got to really watch it. You can miss stuff significantly, or we can miss stuff. Just an example of what a, a stone in the ureter looks like on ultrasound. You can see it here distally in the UVJ. Let's go back. The correlative CT is here. Um, this is the stone in the ureter. It's well visualized. The bladder is distended, and this is a twinkle artifact. It, it produces this color mosaic appearance when you turn on the power Doppler. Um, you can't rely on a twinkle artifact to measure because it typically is larger than the stone itself, but it's a great way of localizing calculi and improving the uh, radiologist's confidence that what we're actually looking at is a stone. I'll talk about that later. Yeah. Um, nobody, the answer is it's, nobody really knows. There's a couple of theories, but, but there's it's physics, there. it's physics. It's physics. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> So, you know, what we're looking for in ultrasound is a, a bright echogenic uh, structure with a clear posterior acoustic shadow, attenuation of the sound beam. But frequently after lithotripsy um, or even ureteroscopy, some of that dense shadowing is lost because we're dealing with small particulate sand or stone fragments and some of the ultrasound images can get past that and you don't get a clear shadow. So putting on the color really can enhance the, the visibility of the stones and the confidence with, when you see this twinkling artifact. This is a case from recently. Uh, the patient had a one centimeter stone in the renal, in the renal uh, pelvis here, uh, had lithotripsy done on the two-week follow-up 
ultrasound. We typically get the ultrasound before the radiograph uh, in follow-up. There's nothing really <coughs> detected in the lower pole, and yet when we put on the color, there's this focal twinkling sign which suggests to us that there's probably a small cluster of debris there. And then on the radiograph, when you look very carefully, you can actually see the stone fragments sitting in the lower pole. Now, this would be very easy to misinterpret this as stool, right? Um, in the absence of, have, of the ultrasound, which shows the twinkle. So the twinkle actually improves our ability to carefully search for residual stones on the radiograph. Um, important caveat, when you have a big stone and no hydronephrosis, it can be difficult to evaluate the true extent of the calculus. This was a patient who was septic, um, who had a, a very large stone in the renal pelvis. Um, we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg here. We can't assess the depth. This is particularly problematic in branch stones or patients who have an extra renal pelvis where a lot of the stone is extending medial to the kidney. And if it's non-dilated, we can miss that. At the time of nephrostomy, this is the extent of the stone. It's quite a bit larger than what we appreciated on ultrasound. And we were only seeing probably this component of the calculus on the ultrasound study. So when you combine ultrasound and radiography, how good is the, uh, is the outcome in terms of follow-up? It's pretty good. Its sensitivity is almost 90% with a very good specificity. So the combination of the two is what we use here at BGH, and we typically, as I mentioned, perform the ultrasound first before the radiograph. So the next thing that I'll talk about is uh, uh, parameters on imaging that may be useful to urologists on CT uh, to predict treatment outcome. Um, there's three that are useful, attenuation value, the skin to stone distance, and internal heterogeneity within the calculus itself when we view it on a bone window. Um, it's a well-known fact amongst the uh, urology community that the higher the attenuation value of the stone, the more difficult it is to fragment. Similarly, stones that have a long skin to stone distance, in other words, greater treatment depth, um, are harder to treat. So when you have a combination of a long skin to stone distance and a high attenuation value, there's an increased risk of shockwave lithotripsy failure. On the other hand, when the stone is lower attenuation and when it's internally heterogene heterogeneous, those are favorable predictors. So if you're in a practice where you're dealing with a lot of stones and this information is important to you and you're not getting it, then ask your radiologist to provide it for you. It's relatively easy to do. We'll now talk about dual energy CT. This is a technology that's been available since 2005. It's undergone gone a number of rapid advances in uh, technologic sophistication. Essentially what we do here is we scan the patient at two different energy levels. So they're scanned uh, usually simultaneously at two different KVPs. And that raw data is analyzed by software using this process called material-based decomposition analysis. Essentially what it does is it looks at the mass absorption coefficient of the stone at different energy levels. And then it does a, uh, a calculation and it uh, provides us with an actual composition, chemical composition of the stone. And the way this works is we have our non-contrast CT. This is the dual energy data set that we're looking at. The observer, radiologist, puts, puts a cursor on the stone, runs the analysis. It takes a few seconds. And then the computer uh, puts a color map on the stone, depending on whether it's uric acid or calcium. If it's calcium based, it's blue. If it's uric acid, it's red. And then it plots that stone. Unfortunately, this doesn't project too well. But this is the stone up here. And you can see there's a reference line up the center. And everything above that reference line will be blue and is calcium. And this one is between uh, oxalate and hydroxyapatite. And anything below the line will be red. And that's where uric acid lives. So this is a calcium uh, oxalate stone. And uh, it gives you a bunch of other features, the volume of the stone and the bidimensional measurements automatically. So in, in centers that have dual energy <coughs> capability, we can do this. Uh, I'll just go back there for a sec. It's been validated in clinical use. Um, originally, the first scanners didn't perform too well in large patients. There were technical limitations, but those have been mostly overcome with the latest generation of scanner, including the one that we have here uh, made by Siemens. Um, the uh, uric acid stones are provided with a uh, red uh, overlay value. This is obviously important for urology and eMERGE docs because if you have a small stone, you know it's uric acid, you can promote uh, spontaneous passage and dissolution with oral alkalization therapy in the urine. 
the so other the application. Sorry. Sorry. Excuse me, what's the radiation dose of that dual energy? Yeah, um, it, well, originally it was slightly higher than conventional, but they have modified uh, the software and, and the hardware side, so it's now comparable. There's no increased dose. Okay. Can you validate that? I don't think if we have or not. I'd have to ask Sauce about that. I'm not sure if they've done that or not. Yeah. But it's been certainly validated. The machine technology of that scanner machine has definitely been validated. Um, <coughs> The other thing that's uh, that's popular uh, in, in in research in radiology right now is the virtual non-enhanced or virtual non-contrast um, uh, study. Uh, essentially, when we're looking for stones historically with CT, we have to scan the patient prior to contrast, so that's a true non-contrast acquisition. But the dual energy technology allows us to uh, perform a post IV contrast dual energy scan, and then the software will actually extract the iodine content from the image and display a virtual non-contrast image. In other words, they're subtracting iodine and giving a soft tissue calcium map, essentially. Okay, So the assumption is that the software is smart enough to be able to subtract iodine but not subtract calcium. Okay, And this has been challenging in situations where the urinary contrast density is very high. The software has traditionally not been that good. Um, but over the, the, the course of a number of years, the uh, second and third generation scanners have been able to provide acceptably good virtual non-contrast resolution and low noise. The question is, how does it perform in clinical use? And when you look at the first generation of scanners that were out, uh, there were significant limitations, and the sensitivity for stones was actually quite poor unless the stone was large. So we were missing a lot of stones. The second generation has definitely improved image quality. It's still considered to be slightly inferior to the true non-enhanced data set. The sensitivity is only moderate for small calculi, so we're still, even with the second generation of scanner, missing small stones routinely. We don't have data yet on the latest generation. It's too new. There isn't any published data on that. Hopefully it will improve, although we have to wait and see. So is this something that can be applied in the emergency department? There was a study from Korea that looked at this. It was published recently. It's using a, a current, a, you know, reasonably state-of-the-art second-generation dual energy scanner. They compared true and virtual non-contrast acquisitions. Uh, they were able to achieve significant dose reduction, which is one of the reasons for doing this, but it, became, it came at the cost of detection of small stones and severe artifacts in up to 10% of patients. So, you know, I think it's not ready for prime time yet. This, this <coughs> example on the right illustrates the limitation quite nicely. Here's a patient with a proximal ureteric stone. It's small. You can clearly see it on the true non-enhanced data set, but it's been subtracted out along with the iodine on the virtual non-enhanced. So this is a problem in the emergency department for both the merge docs and the urologists. It reduces the confidence. We don't know what the cause of the obstruction of the pain is. So, so at this point, I don't think we can support its routine use for detection of calculi in the, uh, in the emergency department or, or elsewhere for that matter. The next thing I'd like to just touch on briefly is our, our, you know, what we do with these small calcifications that we see within the kidney. This is a common problem. We have patients frequently referred in for lithotripsy of these, these calcifications, and many times they're, they're actually parenchymal. Um, and so this is problematic for radiology. Because of the advances in the scanners, it's becoming uh, more and more frequent that we see this. And I think radiologists need to be made aware as to what these things are. Uh, there's been, um, obviously, uh, a lot of research with uh, ureteroscopy in terms of calcifications at the papillary tip. They're very common. It is difficult for us to precisely localize these in the absence of hydronephrosis. And there has been urologic data that suggests that this, the focal calcifications that we are seeing in the papillary tip are actually not uh, Blarandel's plaques. They are uh, calcified plugs of material, stone material, in the papillary ducts. Uh, and you need at least 1% of the papilla to have uh, calcifications in it for us to be uh, radiologically detectable with CT. So they are not Randall's plaques. Um, we, there's certainly data going back to 1999 uh, from UT Southwestern um, that, that CT can be oversensitive for calcifications. And this study 
uh, reflects that. There was a, a comparison between radiography and CT uh, to flexible nephroscopy, second look nephroscopy, uh, immediately after PCNL in a group of patients. They were using at the time a, a state-of-the-art scanner. Um, the urologists were able to see 90% of the calyces. If there was a calyx they couldn't interrogate, that was discounted from the analysis. No surprise, the radiographic sensitivity is poor. That's why the standard of care is CT, post-PCNL for assessment. Um, the sensitivity was very good, but there are 12 false, 12% 12 of the cases were false positive, which meant CT was calling residual stones that were not there on endoscopic assessment. It's possible they could have passed between the CT and the uh, endoscopy, but it's unlikely, and many of those are probably parenchymal calcifications. Is that important um, for management? The answer is yes. There's been a complete paradigm shift uh, in the treatment of many of these small calcifications, and uh, calci calcifications that we have traditionally, as radiologists, viewed as being parenchymal are now potentially recoverable using endourologic techniques, particularly with laser incision of the papilla and laser lithotripsy and extraction of fragments. And this is a case of a, a patient with distal RTA who had a papilla incised. Originally, this was not a detectable stone, but once the papilla was incised, it became recoverable and it was lasered and basketed out. Another patient here with medullary sponge kidney, and these are the calcified plugs that we're talking about. Some, not all, but some of these are <coughs> removable endoscopically. So this has prompted the authors to state that the diagnosis of nephrocalcinosis is no longer a radiologic one, it's actually a urologic one. So as radiologists, we need to be aware of the uh, advances in endourology. So how good actually are we at precisely localizing where these small calcifications are? And this study was out of Zurich. It's a couple years old now. The scanner technology is no longer state-of-the-art, but it's still reasonable. One of the limitations was there was a, a long delay between the CT and reteroscopy. Most of the stones were in the collecting system, and 40% were parenchymal as judged by reteroscopy. And what they found was the sensitivity was moderate overall for precise localization of all stones in the calyx. When the stones were small, the sensitivity was poor. And there were three observers, two radiologists and a urologist, and the inter-observer agreement was, was only uh, moderate or, or uh, fair. When the stones were large, we were actually very good, but we were poor at localizing papillary tip calcifications in the absence of hydronephrosis. Um, so what, what this data says is when the stone is big and it's in a calyx, we're right. When the stone is small in the absence of hydronephrosis, we only have fair accuracy in terms of localization. And we'll just show this, this example from that particular paper. This was a calocele stone on two different projections, which was incorrectly called as parenchymal by two of the three observers. And this was a papillary tip calcification, which was actually parenchymal, not calocele, but it was incorrectly called as being a stone by all three observers. So it highlights the limitation when you don't have hydronephrosis and you don't have previous it makes it difficult for us to be absolutely sure. So in some patients, ureroscopy is the deal breaker. There's no data yet um, that I could find on CT urography as to whether that helps localize these or not. Um, is that clinically relevant? I think it is. Uh, it can change management. Uh, this, is, this is an example of a patient referred to VGH for PCNL. Uh, I think this is Ryan's patient, actually. There are these two unusual clusters of calcifications in the upper pole. You can see on the radiograph that they're sort of finely oriented in a linear distribution, almost like a paintbrush, suggesting localized nephrocalcinosis. Uh, the CT was done, and it's, it confirms that it's probably nephrocalcinosis. So rather than lay an access into this patient, we suggested that a retrograde be done, and that was undertaken. And you can see that the calcifications are distributed peripherally around the edge of the calyx. So we felt probably that this would be non-recoverable stone in, or non-recoverable calcification in the uh, parenchyma, but in fact, uh, the urologist was able to remove a significant percentage of these calcifications, not all, but some. So even though it's parenchymal, it can still be recoverable. Another example here, a patient was referred in again for PCNL. It's an unusual cluster of stones. You can see on the magnified fluoro image that they're linear, sort of paintbrush-like, certainly not the typical appearance for a diverticular stone or cluster of stones, which is what we initially thought. Uh, we were thinking possibly parenchymal. We did the retrograde, and all of these calcifications are in this enlarged papilla focally. Why? We don't know. Why is it just there? Don't know. But ureteroscopy was performed. 
this is Ben's case, and the sense was that these were all suburethelial and not likely to be amenable to laser resection. So in both of these patients, knowing or <coughs> suspecting that these stones were parenchymal on imaging eliminated the necessity for an invasive and costly procedure and prompted a less invasive uh, procedure, which in one of the patients was therapeutic, at least partially. So it can certainly alter management. So it's important to think about parenchymal calcifications <coughs> when, you're, uh, when you're looking at these patients. Um, can we predict stone formation? There is some evidence that papillary tip microcalcifications on thin section CT can be useful. Uh, most of the research that's been done in this has come out of the Barcelona group. They have compared uh, a normal group of controls, renal, uh, potential renal donor candidates, to patients who have stone formation, calcium stone formation. And they were using the attenuation value of the papillary tip immediately adjacent to the renal sinus for comparison. And what they found is that patients with stones had a significantly higher attenuation value than their uh, normal controls. And patients who developed stones who were scanned prior to stone development also had the same higher attenuation. So they postulated that this may be a biomarker for future stone development. They did another study, um, a longitudinal study in 300 patients, 3% 3 of these patients developed stones. They were followed for seven years. And using an ROC analysis, they found that the optimal threshold was 43 Hounsfield units. And they found that 53% of patients who exceeded that attenuation value in the papillary tip developed stones within seven years. So they postulated this is potentially an independent biomarker from other urologic risk factors uh, that may warrant closer scrutiny in these patients. And the same group performed another analysis, and they found that when there are more than three papilla of higher attenuation value, the relative risk is dramatically increased 11-fold. So this is potentially useful information that you as urologists may seek uh, from your radiologist. I think most people in the radiology community are not doing this. This, is, this was news to me. I wasn't aware of this either. But, you know, it's in patients who are increased risk. It may help uh, accelerate surveillance and uh, scrutiny in these patients. So multi-detector CT is a, is a pretty good multi-purpose tool. We're, we're obviously uh, good at uh, detection stones. We're very good at detecting and localizing large stones were not as precise in the absence of hydronephrosis and small calcifications peripherally. Um, we're good at stone burden assessment. Uh, we can provide uh, biomarkers for uh, management, um, assess obstruction. We have a, a, a ability to uh, potentially look at recurrence risk. Uh, virtual non-enhanced imaging, we're not there yet, I don't think, uh, because we're still missing small stones less than two to three millimeters. Um, we are good at alternate diagnoses in the ER, and at some point in the future, not right now, we may be able to deliver all this information to you at a sub-millisievert dose, but that is not yet possible. I think the technology will improve. So moving on to radiation risks, um, there's a lot of concern in, around the world about the increasing uh, dose from medical imaging. Most of that is coming from CT. You can see that there's been a six-fold increase in the radiation dose related to CT. Uh, from 0.5 to 3 millisieverts in the last 35 years. We're not far behind the United States and Canada. We're 3.9 times. Um, this is actually much greater. It's probably almost three times the dose than what people in Vancouver get. So that's a huge amount of radiation on a per capita basis in the U.S. Um, of the 61 million CTs that are performed annually in the U.S., almost 2 million are CTKBs. And the majority of patients who come to emerge with renal colic can get at least two CTs with a very high median dose historically. Um, in Canada, it's, it's good to know what the natural background level is and tell patients this. We have 1.2 units of radiation a year, typically in Vancouver. This is based on uh, government and Triumph data. Uh, goal, it, around BC, it's quite variable. In some portions of the province, it's almost 8 millisieverts, and that relates to radon exposure and natural isotopes in the ground that we don't get in Vancouver. Overall in Canada, it's about 1.8. And uh, historically, there's various different estimates for cancer risk, but uh, one of the estimates is the lifetime attributable risk of cancer death from a single CT scan with a 10 millisievert dose is 0.05% for 5 in 10,000. So putting that into perspective, if a child is born today, there's an approximately 18% risk that that, per that child is going to die of cancer sometime in their life, OK? Lifetime risk. A single CT is going to increase that risk by 0.05%. Right? It's certainly higher in a child, but it's still low. Uh, 
So in children and young adults, we try to find alternate imaging strategies. But um, when you look at the data based on age, the sensitivity of the body to radiation drops dramatically uh, the older we get. So beyond the age of 35, the actual risk, lifetime attributable risk of death from a CT of the abdomen is actually very low. It's between 1 and 2 per 10,000. Okay? Younger patients, it's much higher. The radiosensitive organs include the gastrointestinal mucosa, uh, bone marrow, liver, and spleen. Things like muscle, skeletal, uh, skeletal bone, fat, and skin are relatively insensitive to radiation. So, you know, this is the possibility that we can, uh, there's, there's certainly data out there that says we can deliver small radiation doses in CT and still maintain our sensitivity and specificity. So the question is, how good are we actually at delivering on that? And there is a, uh, a pooled analysis of almost 50,000 renal colic CTs that from 93 centers that was published in uh, one of our major journals. Uh, the data was fairly recent. Uh, the overall mean dose was quite high. Um, only 2% of these exams were performed at what we would consider to be low dose, and 0.2% were performed at what we would consider to be approaching ultra-low dose. So there's a huge margin for improvement. A lot of the limitations are related to patient obesity. Some of them are institution-specific in terms of preference and, and historical uh, uh, issues. Some of it is uh, machine-based limitations, um, but, but we have a lot of room for improvement. So here at VGH, there's a, a very high level of sensitivity to radiation dose. One of our uh, young colleagues, Dr. Patty McLaughlin, working with Ben and myself, did a study which we called the Canucks trial recently in 2014. And essentially what we did was recruit patients prospectively who were going to be having lithotripsy. Uh, they would have the standard of care abdominal radiograph, and they were also consented to have an ultra-low dose CT. Uh, patients with, only with body mass indices less than 30 were included, and we excluded patients who were less than 18 years of age. Um, and then those two uh, studies were compared to the gold standard which is conventional dose CT that was available at outside institutions prior to the study prior to them being uh, uh, referred in for treatment. A total of 83 patients uh, were enrolled. The mean dose for abdominal radiographs was 0.4 millisieverts. For the conventional CT, it was 6. And for the ultra-low dose CT, it was uh, just over half of the dose of a radiograph. And that's the mean dose. Um, that's 1 20th of the dose of the uh, conventional radiograph. So what was the performance level of CT? It turns out it was very good. The sensitivity and specificity were both over 95%. There were two false negatives. Both of those were tiny stones that were less than 2 millimeters. Um, this is an example of one of the patients from the study. Here's the stone on the radiograph. Here's the stone on the conventional CT. Here's the stone on the low-dose CT. A couple of observations. This is a crappy-looking image. Okay, These are not ca easy cases to read. Um, they're quality-degraded images. The reason why we can see the stone is because there's a high natural contrast between the stone and surrounding tissue. Um, stones are hundreds of Hounsfield units. Soft tissue is, or fat is, just barely above zero or even negative for fat. So, so the uh, contrast uh, to background ratio is very high between the pathology and normal tissue. That's what enables us to use low dose in these patients. Uh, another one case, of the patients... I, sorry? Sorry, can that case go back to yeah. picking up a... Stone in the other yeah, yeah, there's, there's a stone in the other kidney. Yeah, there's a slight change in position of the stone between the original study, which was outside, and, and where the stone is now. Yeah, but there's, you're right, there's another stone there too. Um, this was one of the false <coughs> negative cases. This was a small distal ureteric stone. It was seen confidently on the conventional dose CT. Uh, on the ultra low dose CT, it's present, but it was misinterpreted as a flea bullet, and that's because of the surrounding noise. So, so we're not perfect. We're going to miss small stones, some patients. Uh, but with meticulous assessment and careful patient selection is an option for evaluating the location of a stone in somebody who's going to be undergoing active management. So in summary, the strengths of radiology uh, imaging, CT is certainly the preferred imaging modality in a non-pregnant or non-pediatric patient. The dual energy uh, technology has matured a lot and alters a multi-parametric assessment of stone disease and can guide um, management by assessing uh, factors that may, be, uh, may identify future risk. Ultrasound alone or in combination with radiography is considered to be the standard of care for follow-up of most patients uh, following treatment and on surveillance. Submillisievert scanning is feasible, but it is quality degraded 
you have to choose the patients carefully and it has not been validated yet for application in the emergency department. It's never been tested for the detection of alternate diagnoses. Okay, That's an important thing to remember, so we can't implement it in the ER just yet. In the future, there's a good chance that it will work out, but at this point the data isn't there. The virtual non-enhanced images so far, that technology is not quite ready for prime time. We're going to routinely miss small stones. And that's potentially clinically significant. Another limitation, CT may be inaccurate and precise localization of small papillary tip calcifications or small calicial stones in the absence of previous imaging or hydronephrosis. So in those patients, think about the possibility of ureteroscopy if you're considering uh, management. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, don't rely purely on ultrasound for management decisions. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk just about some practical aspects of radiology, particularly in stone disease when it comes to urology. So do we need preoperative imaging? Is it essential to uh, pri prior to ureteric stone surgery? So these are just stones in the ureter, people coming for ureteroscopy. And what they found in these patients who had stones between 3 to 20 millimeters, they basically did a KUB or a CT scan or both on the day of surgery and found that up to about 14% of patients were cancelled on that day because no stones were identified on that preoperative imaging. Basically, uh, most of them were cancelled. Some of them had to be confirmed by CT scan, and most of the patients passed the ureteral stone and therefore could avoid unnecessary surgery. So certainly some preop imaging within 24 hours of, of surgery is, is uh, uh, recommended. Now, how about contrast? In Europe, they often recommend that you actually get uh, intravenous contrast with your CT scan or a, a regular IVP, which is very difficult to get here now in Canada. But essentially what you find here is there's no difference. The stone free rate between IVP, CT, or a CT IVP and an ultrasound and a KUB, the stone free rate complications are essentially similar. So you do not need to give contrast prior to any kind of uh, ureteroscopy, unless there's some kind of indication where you're wondering, you know, is it a duplex system? Uh, you want to get some idea if it's a calicial diverticulum or, or other uh, clinical indications. So Yair Lotan is a urologist, but he does a lot of economic uh, analyses. And one of the things they did was, how much does it cost uh, the system if you basically have silent obstruction and you don't get routine imaging in everyone after ureteroscopy? So they did a decision tree. This is not you know, based on any retrospective data, but looked at the fact that basically for a patient is about $5,196 for, for selective imaging. And if everyone gets imaging, it's only about $130 more, $5,300. They assume about a 2% rate of silent obstruction. So I think that's a little bit high, but they think that about 2% of kidneys get silent obstruction. The, the, basically that each kidney that they would save would uh, cost about $6,200. Basically, they're saying that $130 more per patient would justify imaging all patients after ureteroscopy. Now, that was just based on an, uh, on an economic analysis, but I'm going to show you some other data here that probably is more real life and probably what, what we do and what we should do, and I'll tell you about the AUA guidelines. <clears throat> this is a, a data from Kingston and from Western Ontario. They looked at 94 cases. Six patients afterwards had hydronephrosis. Now, two of those were due to obstructing stones, so obviously we would have known that. And actually, the four patients who did develop ureteral strictures all had risk factors. Things like significant ureteral trauma, a significantly impacted stone, pre-existing <coughs> renal function impairment, or basically when you looked in there, you saw a stricture. So essentially, they say that routine post-operative imaging is not necessary in all patients unless they're symptomatic or unless you have a high suspicion at the time of ureteroscopy. This is from the Cleveland Clinic. They actually did a questionnaire to see what the imaging practice patterns are for urologists currently. And what they found was that uh, routine imaging was done in only about 48% of urologists. So over half of the urologists didn't do routine imaging in all of their uh, ureteroscopy patients. That's not to say they didn't do any. It was really just not, I don't routinely do it all, only if they're symptomatic and you know certain cases. But the majority of that was essentially uh, ultrasound and then combined with KUB and ultrasound in about 30% and then just KUB alone. And the very few of it was done by CT or IVP. So then they were asked, well, why didn't you do any imaging? Like, why, why would you not do imaging? Most pe a lot of pe people were concerned about costs, and some people were concerned about radiation exposure as well, too. And then about 57% uh, said that the ultrasound is not, not diagnostic. So if you, uh, basically, predictors of imaging were basically if you had a lot of postoperative pain, you thought there would be residual stones, if you perforated the kidney, or if they had a solitary kidney. <clears throat> These are direct quotes taken out of the AUA guidelines. 
So from previous studies, the incidence of postdoctoral obstruction is low, particularly in asymptomatic patients. So if they're symptomatic, you're obviously going to get imaging anyways. But uh, basically, they, uh, they, they sort of talk on both sides of their mouth here a little bit. They say that imaging to detect the, care rate, the, the rare case of silent obstruction is really not cost effective. You need about 25 cases to sort of detect one silent obstruction. And although seemingly small price to pay, this is hardly justi justifiable from an economic viewpoint, but the panel believes that because of the low cost and lack of ionizing radiation, ultrasound should be done in everybody. You know, it's that classic American real, you know, cover, cover your butt sort of uh, uh, medicine, you know, worried about getting sued. So basically, uh, and, and if you are worried about stones, you can see them on KUB, but they do recommend ultrasound and routine follow-up. In terms of their decision tree, basically, if you pulled out the uh, stone intact, so you just basket it, if they're not symptomatic, they recommend a uh, ultrasound. If there's no hydro, nothing else needs to be done. If there is hydro, they recommend CT with contrast. And of course, if they're symptomatic, they're going to recommend a CT here. So essentially, ultrasound for everybody is what the AUA recommends. Is this, this is, uh, now, and, and just to talk about what we do, uh, probably me and Ryan, I do image all of your patients afterwards. Right? Yeah, like a, like a four millimeter distal UVJ stone. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So I mean, they're going to get imaging anyways to follow up for kidney stones. Um, but if I'm worried, we're getting into about six to eight weeks. But they should be getting something maybe at a year's time. But would that that would obviously be too long for silent obstruction? It might damage the kidney. But I, I think that I'm the same with Ryan. I, I do ultrasound imaging in not all patients, but I would say a good majority. And particularly if I'm worried about any kind of perforation. If I'm worried about a perforation or stricture developing, I should get a CT scan. Now, this is something new. This is uh, something new from Mike Bailey's group in University of Washington. This is essentially ultrasound uh, to basically propel kidneys. So what they did in patients who were awake with no sedation in the clinic after shock with the trypsy, or they also did it in patients who were um, under anesthetic for ureteroscopy. Basically, it's a typical machine but it's capable of emitting longer durations, slightly higher amplitude pulses, and you can actually use it to reposition stones. So what they ended up doing was they um, ended up, you can watch this on a, on, a, on, a, uh, on a stone phantom here. So this isn't a phantom, there's the stone right there, and you'll see the stone move from the upper pole in, down into the UPJ and the ureter. So this is a pretty cool new technology that they're trying to use, and we're gonna be working with them in the future um, in the lithotripsy unit to try and move stones potentially after shock with lithotripsy. You can see applications in the emergency room where they might be able to move a stone out of the UPJ obstructing back into the renal pelvis <laughs> or the lower pole. They were able to move about 65% uh, uh, of stones in this small clinical trial and there was no damage done to the kidneys. Patients weren't uh, uncomfortable. They were all done, or most of them were done awake. And the 30% uh, of them, they displaced them greater than 3 millimeters to a new location. And the largest stone they could move was about 10 millimeters. So this will be an exciting new technology. And we're going to be uh, doing a clinical trial, hopefully, with them next year. Now, Chuck talked about this. And I think this is a, a really good article that was just published in October of last year. And they looked at how much radiation you would get in the United States once you got the diagnosis of a kidney stone. And it ranged anywhere from 1 to 37 millisieverts. So... Now, the um, conventional non-contrast CT of the abdomen pelvis is 10 to 20 millisieverts, and that's their low dose. And it's interesting whenever I go to the, the meetings and talk to the Americans, and they'll talk about uh, uh, their non-contrast, and they'll, they'll, their average is between 8 to 14 millisieverts for their non-contrast. And ours is like 2 to 4, 2 to 3? Uh, ours is approximately 4.6. 4.6, so it's much lower than the average that's of the American one. That's for the standard. Okay, that's a standard dose. So, what about the low? What about the low dose? The low dose uh, is, is one to three. It's about two to three. Yeah, so it's about two to three, and that's their low dose is between you know eight to fourteen. So, you know, majority of the radiation comes from CT scans. Fluoro doesn't. Uh, it obviously increases when you have you know more stones, and basically you know fluoro during during ureteroscopy is not really a big deal. Okay, I'm going to skip over this here. Um, I want to just talk about uh, some data we've been doing with the Endourologic Disease Group for Excellence. So um, Mitch Humphreys and I from Mayo Clinic have, have helped uh, form this uh, 
uh, and, and Dirk is on it as well too, where we are basically looking at uh, stones and we're doing a lot of collaborative research together. And Hillary uh, Brotherhood actually did this study with us and we looked at the natural history complications, re-intervention rates of asymptomatic renal stones after ureteroscopy. And there have not been any reports on stones greater than four millimeters. We wanted to look at the ones greater than four millimeters. And we wanted to see if we could predict any kind of fragment complications. And essentially what we found was that patients, um, most of them, the 56% had no intervention, they were asymptomatic, they didn't have any problems within, within their uh, one to one and a half year follow-up. But 29% of them did get intervention. We don't know if this was because of symptoms or if it was just because it was planned. And 15% did have a complication, but no intervention, so they went to merge, you know, had pain, passed a stone. <clears throat> but when you look at the passage of fragments, the natural passage, it's about 27% for both groups, whether it's less than four millimeters or four millimeters or greater. And the growth of fragments, however, was significantly higher in patients where the fragment was greater than four millimeters. You're also, your rate of complication was higher, and those patients with greater than four millimeter stone fragments had uh, more reintervention. So the only predictor was the original stone size. The bigger your stone size is originally, the more likely you are to have a bigger fragment greater than four millimeters. But, uh, and then basically if you were older and also a location in the renal pelvis also made a difference as well too. When you do this on a Kaplan-Meier curve, the uh, blue, the fragment size, which is greater than four millimeters or, or larger, basically fell out faster. They had more complications and um, problems and needed reintervention sooner, essentially. <coughs> so in summary for that, fragments after ureteroscopy that are greater than four millimeters have higher stone growth, complication, and reintervention rates. And that kind of speaks to Chuck's uh, uh, point that, you know, really we need to sort of be looking and trying to get all of the stones out, not just some of them. So I'm going to stop there. I think we need about 10 minutes for questions. For, and I'd like to really thank Chuck for, for uh, coming and speaking with us. We work so closely with radiology. So we really do appreciate that working relationship. Thank you. Thank you.